questions about having a live demo coming from America about what was happening in the jet stream just a little while ago. And uh, I'm going to try and explain a little bit what's happening. There's about 10 tons of air above me if I have a square meter, 1,000 kilometers. So the weight of that much air around the earth of the equator is, so it's going about 1,100 million tons, traveling at 1,000 miles an hour on a track that's 40,000 kilometers. And then it gets warmed up because it's at the equator. So it goes higher and higher, and air is coming in from stuff like that. And if it goes up like that, it has to move to higher latitudes. And if it goes up to higher latitudes, the length of the railway track that it's on, which used to be 40,000 latitude, it's only got half the length. So here's this train, 400 million tons, 1,000 miles an hour, and it's only got half the track it needs to have. So the only way it can be three, I think, that pattern rotates around and it's inducing all the uh, low pressures and high pressures down, down below. But if the temperature in the Arctic the position, so you get droughts in America that go on for two years, or floods in, in, in Somerset that go on for months and months. And it's because that's stationary that you get either extremes of drought in some places and extremes over to PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. That is a link to get you that, uh, that lovely display if you want to get it, and that will circulate it to the Institute later on. Uh, if we go to here, that's a still of it, in case we couldn't get it working, but we can. And this now is showing you the amounts of ice which various models, here's a whole bunch of models down here, are predicting for the September time when the Arctic ice is minimum. And if you just look at this, the most, um, uh, the one that's going to happen earliest is saying 2040. And some of these here are predicting sort of 2200. All right? And they can't, there's so much scatter, you've got to assume that they can't all be right. And in fact, maybe not any of them are right. Now, this is actually what some other kind of model is saying. This is a thing called pyre mass. And this is showing minimum Arctic sea ice volume from 79 to 2013. And here we're steadily around about this level. But if you look down here, you'll see that there is rather a disturbing trend. And if you were, if this was a stock market or political poll results, there's no much doubt about what you do. But the Hadley Center, who are in charge of uh, all the uh, weather forecasting and climate research in this country, say that there's going to be a a, a negative feedback, which is going to stop it going completely zero, it's going to recover. And this was given in evidence to the Commons Environmental Law Committee. And I wrote to the, to the, the, the chief scientist there and uh, said, can you tell me what these negative feedbacks are? Because all we can see is positive feedbacks. And she sent me a list of references and none of them actually had any bearing at all on the problem. So you have no reason. And this is Time mass is still a computer model, uh, but it has been compared with actual measurements of people from sonar and submarines and chaps with drills and tachymeters and so on. And if you look at this, you can see that it is, here's comparing the, the actual thickness measure with tape measure against the pyre mass prediction here. And you can see the pyre mass is underestimating the thick ice, but it's planning to overestimate the thin ice. So things are a little bit worse than pyre mass is saying. And the, reason, the difference between pyre mass and all those other models are that its coefficients are tweaked in result of what the observations are. So it's like a climate model that's continually updating. All the other ones were just the regular day-to-day -day forecasting, which is incredibly good for a few days ahead. But they're just using the same software to work out what's happening 100 years ahead. OK, and this is another way of showing it. Here is 1979 with all the different months for the ice volume. And you can see it spiraling down. There was actually, amazingly, a little bit of a rescue in, in 2013. Another way to show it, uh, sorry, another way to show it, is this, where we've got uh, the, the maximum ice in about March, and the minimum in September. And this, this trend is, is a, a, a match. Here are some actual satellite models to show that we're in pretty good agreement. Uh, Cryosat has just been going for two years, 
and it can only work, very difficult to measure the thickness of ice, it can only work uh, when there's no melt water on the top. So it, make, what, it that works fine when things are getting colder, but not when they're getting warmer. And then here is showing all the uh, ice records. This is against day number here, going back to 1979 up to now. And 20, 2012 was this terribly low bit here. And we, the red one here was the, we got the reprieve, it was the bounce back. But the bad news is that the yellow one is 2014, this is right up to, to date. And it looks to my eye as if this is about to go over top dead center. So the next really few weeks are going to be really important to see what, whether it is going to come over to here and then down here, or whether it's going to follow this pattern here. The slopes of these are amazingly similar, so the fear is that this will have the same slope as these, but starting at the time. Okay. And if we look at this one, finally, this is showing the temperature anomalies. So this part of the world is 10 degrees Kelvin, or C, lower than it should have been, and this is a lot that's warmer. And this is showing you how these um, uh, waves of the, of, the, of the jet stream are, uh, are, are acting up and showing the temperature. Right. Now, the worry that we have is, is these positive feedbacks. If we lose the ice in the Arctic, then the sun is bouncing on top of the ice in, um, in, in the summertime. If a lot of it's reflected off. You lose the ice, it goes into the water. And the difference is in about 80% and about 8% of how much uh, goes into the... Uh, next thing is that if you do melt the top surfaces uh, of, of the land around and of the Arctic Ocean itself, you expose black carbon. And this is from Greenland, where there's supposed to be snow, it's supposed to be white and you can see it isn't very white. And this means more heat going in to melt. And the rate of melting of Greenland is about three times faster than anybody ever imagined it could be. And this, all this water here, you see, sorry. The next one is methane coming out of per permafrost. If you have a uh, uh, shallow sea, like the East Siberian Arctic Shelf, 30, 50 meters deep, if you look at the bottom of that, there's a whole lot of things called class rates, which are uh, methane and water mixed together, but having a density harm in water, so it's like lemon sorbet. If you warm it up or reduce the pressure, methane comes bubbling up. And there is a picture of methane from 203 to 210. If we go more recently, I'll fl flash back to them. Sorry. That's some, trying to send us a message about new things. And there's some Russians up there who are saying it's coming out in great gushes now. And methane is very much nastier than uh, carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. The IPCC says it's 23 times worse. But that's only if you average it over 100 years. And the half-life is much less than 100 years. So uh, here's the, assuming nobody really knows what half-life is. But this is for 9 years, 12 years, and 15 years. And if 9 years is half life, it's 250 times worse than, uh, than CO2. The areas under these curves are all 23 times 100 years. Right, now, so we've got lower solubility of carbon dioxide in the sea water. It's usually got a little up. Sea gets warm up, you can't take it up. Uh, there's more water vapor in the atmosphere. We've got proof of that now. Water vapor is such a powerful greenhouse gas that they don't draw it on the, most of the grass because it would swamp everything else. Um, we get bushfires in the Amazon Basin. They're all releasing a lot of carbon and they're black, so they absorb more heat. And we've got 9 billion people all wanting to have the same standard life as America. Okay, and then so far this carbon trading has not saved any carbon at all. It's made a lot of money for people who are betting on it, but it hasn't saved any carbon at all. I have that from a carbon trader, a big um, electricity company. Right, now, this is a picture of the world taken from a geostationary satellite, which is always uh, traversing, uh, taking images over noon. And you can see that the sea is very black when you're looking at it directly from above. And the clouds are quite white. Uh, this is three channels out of a thing called motor satellite. It's supposed to give you the most accurate shortwave radiation image, combining those three. And 
Uh, this was noticed when we first started getting satellite images back. This is the Bay of Biscay around here. That's the Isle of Wight, where I was an apprentice, and this is where they're getting all the floods now. But on that day, they saw these funny ship tracks. Okay. Uh, this is where something that the ship was doing was making the clouds whiter. It not ha doesn't happen all the time, but it's uh, it enough to interest um, the, the atmospheric physicists. And this chap here called Sean Cooley was very interested in why clouds sometimes look white and sometimes look grey. He was particularly triggered by these um, these ship tracks, and he worked out an expression for what the, how the reflectivity of a cloud depended on the depth of the cloud and the liquid water content and the number of drops in the cloud. And this is his equation, which you uh, don't need to follow about. But it, what it means is that if you have a lot of small drops, you get a white cloud. And if you have a small number of big drops, you get a dark cloud. And that should not surprise anybody here, because when you get uh, a thunderstorm approaching, they say the dark storm clouds are gathering. That means that the drops are getting nearly big enough to start falling. If you see rain coming out of the bottom of the you can do something. It looks very black indeed. So, a lot of small ones, uh, white, a few big ones, dark. And to prove that, here is a glass jar full of uh, four millimeter balls, glass balls. And here is one which has got 40 micron glass ball. And you can see that they're, that, that they're, they're different brightnesses. Okay, now, the next thing you need to know is that to make a cloud drop, you must have a tiny little nucleus, a little dust, a little smoke, something, to uh, get it started. You can't get a, 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 a cloud drop made from nothing. And in the air in this room, because all oh, our skin is falling off and we've got mud on our boots and dust and blood and everything, there's probably a thousand, or maybe up to five thousand, little nuclei, all of which would form a drop in a cubic centimeter. Okay. That's a, a hell of a we're breathing in all the time, and unfortunately breathing that as well. Uh, this means that if I boil a kettle, the steam's coming out of the spout, it'll be able to form a cloud of drops that we can see very quickly, very close to the, the spout of the kettle. But over the sea, uh, these things are being rained out and falling out and they've been going down. And so the number of nuclei or the number of drops in the egg here is really down 50, 25, much, much lower. And this means that over the sea, the drops have to be a lot bigger to take them underwater that can't stay in this vapor. So you see we've got over land, you've got drops here, which are, this is radius, maddening, the engineers can't think about radius. You've got radiuses down to sort of six, whereas over here you've got radiuses of 14, uh, 14 and more. All right, and this means that uh, it might be possible to increase the number of nuclei over the sea. If we could find a way to get more nuclei over the deficit nuclei in the mid ocean. Uh, we could maybe get a larger number of smaller crops. And Jack or John Latham uh, wrote a little letter to Nature in 1990 about this. <laughs> And a little bit later after that, I was working on trying to make the sea evaporate faster. And I was trying to scrub a lot of water in the sky. And he heard about this, and he asked me if I could um, help do this. And I said, yeah, sure, no problem. We know all about how to make spray. That was a lie, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, and his idea was that if we have very small drops, they evaporate quickly. They leave salt residues, which are absolutely perfect. Uh, hydrophilic condensation you know, there's the, the, the osmosis and pressure and all this love, love that. Uh, there's lots of turbulence over the sea when the wind is blowing and uh, nature doesn't like uneven distributions so we're expecting that in a few hours what we spray will be pretty evenly mixed through the bottom bit of the atmosphere called the marine boundary layer. This is maybe a thousand, two thousand meters thick. Above that it suddenly gets very calm and the mixing isn't as fast but we, have, we think we can get an even distribution through the mean boundary layer. And typically, if there's a 25 micron drop in the cloud top now, and you bring another nuclei, a nucleus near it, you'll get water evaporating from the, um, the, the, the big drop and condensing on the small one. So the water molecules going in and out all the time like microbolics. And if you uh, shared 
uh, that runs water between two nuclei, as it were, you then get two drops of 19.8 microns instead of one of 25. And if you work out what the area is, it's bigger. And this is explaining how the, the, the tube effect works. And uh, if you do the equations, you do double the number of drops, and the reflectivity of the cloud goes up by about 0.85 or 0.86, that sort of thing. Now, actually, reflection is a lot more complicated than that is polarization and angular incidence and all kinds of stuff. That, you can see why it ought to work. <coughs> and when you put the equation into, to this equation, into places where you've got one number for the uh, clean Pacific and not such clean air in the Atlantic, North Atlantic, and here we've got the drop concentration on log scale going from 10. So you can get around the Antarctic <coughs> up to 100. Somewhere in this region, the reflectivities here, here's the reflectivity, are a fairly constant slope in that, that region here. And this is the, the equation again. And so we, it looks as if by bumping them up from uh, here and here, we've got enough increase in, in reflectivity to make a really big difference. Now, if we wanted to undo all the damage that, we have, that we've done so far to uh, the, the, the Earth's atmosphere, um, we need to increase its reflectivity by only half a percent. Enormous numbers, but tiny differences. Okay, now I put this into volumes of spray. Um, this is a bit disputed, this, but I've got a whole lot of assumptions about the depth of the boundary layer and how deep the clouds are and how much liquid water content is and so on. And it, nobody's really challenged these until very recently. They've already said them. And then and people were trying to say we were wrong about uh, the, the, um, the number of nuclei that are there now. But if this is right, and for a long time nobody challenged it, we could undo all the damage um, that we've done so far somewhere by spraying about somewhere between 5 and 10 cubic meters of water a second as 0.8 micron drops. And if we are stupid enough to go on emitting carbon, which we probably are, then we'd be wanting to go up to about uh, 3.7 watts, that's the middle of the range. So we'd want to be spraying somewhere between maybe 30 and 70, depending on whether we're doing the Pacific or the Atlantic, uh, to uh, cancel that. It gets harder and harder as you cancel more because it's a, it's a fractional number of drops in the cloud that is doing the job. Um, right, now, uh, we know that to make this work, you need to get uh, clean air, you need to get lots of sunshine coming in so that it can be balanced off. Uh, you want to be away from places that might be dirtying it, so we don't want to be near the downstream of the desert. And this is a, a bit of a subjective estimate of where the good places are according to the season. And you can see that uh, it's got a good idea to be able to migrate from the season here down to here. Red are the really great places, yellow are pretty good. Okay. And, uh, but we do want to migrate. But ideally, we'd like to be in the, the summer hemisphere. And what we want to do is to have clean mid-ocean air apart from shipping lanes, migrate the seasons, We've got to use locally available energy, whatever, however we're going to make the spray. We want to be there all the time. We have a problem getting food and water and medical attention, home leave and all that stuff for people who are accruing these, these things out there. So this points very strongly to having unmanned robotic uh, sailing vessels, which all the energy is coming from, from the wind. Uh, we can have all the communications to them that are happening now. That I mean, they're flying drones over Afghanistan and being able to knock off individual Taliban. So all that stuff is, is there. It might not have been there 20 or 30 years ago. And if we now look at a nice picture of a sailing vessel, um, this is Kati a beautiful thing. But it did take rather a lot of crew to tie the big knots and set them together from the ground and things. And if we're going to have it unmanned, we need to think of something a bit more like this. This is a ship uh, which was built in 1926 by a chap called Anton Kvetner. And he had a race from the Baltic to the East uh, against exactly the same harbor with conventional sails. 
And they went to an Odyssey through an Oscar storm, and they were all right. And uh, he won the race, and then he sailed off to New York, across the Atlantic, in his ship. Um, and instead of having sails, it's got these funny round rotors which are spinning. And this is, if you have a rotor spinning and you have a wind blowing across it, it gives you exactly the same behavior as an aeropole section, but very much higher lift coefficients. And anyway, he got to New York, everyone thought this was great, and he got lots of orders. He got, I think, either six or ten orders for more ships. And then the 1929 depression came along, and he only got one of them. You know, all the other orders were cancelled, but he were fast. Okay. And this is a, from a Spanish magazine. Most of Flatner's papers were destroyed in World War II. Um, this is from a Spanish magazine, and I don't, if you look here, it says a, a 9 HP uh, motor for spinning the rotor. Okay. Now, an arm may be upward and I've to pick up with one hand. So we're using to spin the cylinders about you know, a few percent of what you need if you're going to drive everything from the engine down here. And here's a very convincing picture. Here is the unmodified sailing vessel. And here, are the, you can see the size of the sail. You can see the size of the rotors to give the same thrust. There's two rotors there. And this is from Handel, the great name in aerodynamics from 1925. And if you've got the, uh, instead of having annual instance, which you have for the military drag of an airfoil, um, we have the spin ratio. That's how, far, how much faster the, the drum is spinning with the wind speed. And you can see that we've got uh, lift coefficients up to at least 10. But that's in a computer, so we don't really believe it. And there's a bit of a kink around about 10. And you can see the drag coefficient to get spin ratio is actually tending to reduce. Right? Uh, an ordinary airfoil works typically with a lift coefficient of about 0.8. The maximum you can get when they land is about 1.6 with a bit more with, with flats. So you see we're getting enormously much more lift than you would with an airfoil. Um, and we made a little one like this. We, there was a chap called Alexander Song, um, who was a, he, he more had started um, for computerized fluid dynamics. He was a boxer. And he thought that having these fences were, would be a good idea. And this is a small boat going on. We're just blowing towards us. And you can see it's really nipping on quite well. That's the weight of it. A chap built by John Marples. And uh, Discovery Channel gave him some money to convert a big ship, and uh, this is testing off Florida, and we've got these song fences up here, and it was really very nice. You could go faster than the wind, you can stop dead in the water and go directly back, and you can rotate about your own axis or any other axis just by changing the speeds of those rotors. So it's computer friendly, it's very agile, and it's uh, only about half the height of the sail that you can get. And I'm just behind that thing there, so I'm obviously. <laughs> okay, now this is another ship. This is a real ship. It's a 10,000 ton ship built by Endicon to ship their wind turbines around the place. And they've only got these, these fences on the very top, which is what Clepham originally had. We've had some work done by some modelers at Manchester, and they show that the gain in the fences isn't really worth having, but there's a bit more drive torque needed to drive them. So from now on, we won't be using uh, fences. So this is what our machine would have looked like, and we're, we've got our fences up here, and it's belting through the water, uh, we're dragging these turbines through the water. Now those are enormously much bigger than you need for the propeller. And uh, we found that actually they weren't going to give us as much power as we might need. That's a, an engineering drawing. We won't see much in PowerPoint. But the plan was to have all the spray drying equipment put into little sockets along here. That would be the, the turbine generating it. And we have another option of generating it with a, a flat back here. I was drawing versus them. And let's go ahead. Uh, what I want to do now uh, is, instead of having a trimaran 
and the displacement panel, as they call them in the main hull. I want, I want to generate a lot more power. We probably need about three times more power than our guess. And I want to use this sort of ship. This is a, 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 a incredible racing vessel called Etoptair, French one, and it's flying on hydrofoils. Oh, sorry. It's flying on hydrofoils here. There's a little bit of thing a bit like an aeroplane wing down here and another bit here. And this is, can go over 60 miles an hour. <coughs> quite staggering. And uh, we want to borrow some technology from them. And the plan view of the ship that we want to have now, here's the main length of the hull. And I want to have some um, things called ACCAs, which are arms that go out here to join onto a thing called an AMA up here. These are all Polynesian words. And the only difference now is that I want to have these able to, to move around. Here's the front view. Here is main hull, which is out of the water now. And we've got the AMAs, which be used for giving stability when you're moving very slowly. And below here, I want to have hydrofoils. And this is a parallelogram motion. Okay. Now, the nice thing about this is that I've got, instead of having just two atoms, I've got four. And I can change the angle of incidence of these foils. So I've got foils where I can change the angle of incidence. Now, if you were just flying normally on hydrofoils, each foil would take a quarter of the weight of the vessel. But if I increase the forward one on one side and reduce the port one, I'd get a torque that's trying to make the vessel roll that way. And if I did the very opposite here, I'd get a torque that's going to go that way. So I've got the torque on the hull that's doing that. All right. But uh, it's being beautifully balanced. And that means that the, if I increase uh, one and then take the extra force on the hydraulic ram, I can generate a great deal of energy from the point of view of the, uh, from these movements, the rudder movements. It would look a bit like an ungainly model, but the actual backer would be, to the little hull, would be actually moving very steadily. I can make it uh, run a lot more steadily than an ordinary ship because I've got control of pitch and row from the forces I put on there. So this is a way to get a lot of power with a very little drag on the, on, on the, 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 the vessel. Right, now we need to think about how to make drops. And this is a classic photograph taken by Rob Rayleigh back in 1878 when photography wasn't all that advanced. And he's got a jet coming in here, and you can see it's growing little bulges, and that they're breaking out. You can also see some little uh, other small drops, and maybe that one's a bit bigger. So he looks pretty even here, but the breaking out is a little bit, a little bit um, uncertain. And uh, if we're going to use this system to make the drops we want, we have got to have a very, very small jet here. I mean, we're still talking about microns. And everybody who I spoke to from the inkjet industry said it was going to be completely impossible to filter plankton-rich dust in oil or seawater to the level that we need for, for the jet size that we expect we want. And uh, then I found out a bit more about filters, and you're probably all too young to remember poliomyelitis. This is a horrible disease that paralyzed a lot of young people in the, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, now you don't get it because you will get the salt, the salt curve. It was, it, was, it was eliminated, except from uh, Afghanistan, um, by the um, salt vaccine. But in those days, they had to filter. And a polio glass is about that size, about 29 nanometers. And they wanted filters cover up that. Right? So they've got all this filtration process going. We don't need it for polio now, but we do want it for pre-cleaning the water that's going to reverse osmosis. And uh, these guys, uh, this is showing you the volume of sales of this, this technology for reverse osmosis. It's uh, shooting up. Uh, year by year, and they're already filtering far more water than we need. And the way this has to work is to have um, a whole bunch of filters in parallel, and one of them is being backflushed with a fraction of the water that's going through the others. And they all take in turn. So I've got eight filters, and one of them is having some of the water going back through it. 
and that's the block diagram. <coughs> now we're going to have to make a, a, a filtration system, and the way we want to do it, this is the first picture we have of this, is to get a silicon wafer and to etch a whole bunch of holes nearly all the way through the silicon wafer from one side, and then a lot smaller ones, meeting joining up with them from the other side. This is due to Tom Stevenson in my publication. And uh, he worked out that we could make using the silicon wafer if we could get uh, the right size of model. And the wonderful thing about microfabrication is that numbers don't seem to worry. If you say you want three billion more than two and a half just click and go and you mask and you know, what happens. Um, it was a bit of messing about to do it. But numbers, large numbers, are not frightening. And uh, we then started simulating different uh, conditions for different drops and different pressures and, and so on. And this is done by uh, Andreas Tsiamis, who's also up in my publication now. And we found that, just as Lord, Lord Bradley had found, that there were some coalescence and some breakups that we got between the satellite ones. But if we pulsed the water with a little high, little pressure signal at the right frequency, we could get beautifully monodispersed drops. Um, and go on. And these are the pressures and the frequencies and the drop balance that you need for any size of drop. And we think, the atmospheric there's a sample that size of that, we think we got about 0.8 microns, so we look up its uh, pressure and its nozzle diameter and its excitation frequency. And we know all that. And it would be nice to have a bit of money to actually try it. Um, the present shape of Tom Stevenson's nozzles is designed to reduce the viscous losses. If you just have a straight passage, there's an awful viscous drop. But an amazing thing about a crystal with a cubic lapis is that you can etch pyramid shaped holes in it where you do uh, a whole bunch of little steps um, in the etching process. You only got very much choice about the angle. It's got to be 54.74 degrees. But you can make a way to get a very, very tight little nozzle here and just here. Now, the dimensions here are broken up. This is about 0.75 millimeter. The holes are about um, 50,000 nanometers, and we're only talking about about 400 nanometers for this nozzle size here. And you're a bit worried that the etching is a bit um, uh, uh, faster at the edge or in the middle of a, of a, of a, of a wafer. Um, and this is how it might look. We've got a silicon wafer up here that's going to be clamped between two grids. And we've got a piezoelectric crystal here which is pulsing it. And in order to pulse it at this frequency, these crystals have got a hell of a big permittivity. The fastness is enormous. And so we need a very short distance to the next one with very, very thick conductors made out of stuff called Litzwar, which is uh, trying to stop the current going out to the skin, skin of the water. And the other thing we've got to do is to be able to back flush these wafers as well as back flushing the water coming through filters. So we have to have a hatchway that we can shut the exit of a, of, a, of a filter and then blow fresh water back through it and also maybe blow very dry air through it because we can't afford to have these things ever getting iced up. And so we have hatches here which can be closed down here. That's, that's opening the hatch or closing it. So here we are. This, hat, this hatch has put this lid, lid down here. And this is showing you how we're sloshing the current <coughs> backwards and forwards between two piezo crystals. This is a, if you throw them with a sort of single end oscillator, you have a big problem supplying the current. So it's better to make it drive back and forth between the two of them. Right. Now, um, the Hadley Center uh, published this as the effect of cloud geoengineering on rainfall. And they put this up uh, on their website without going into the background details of what, where you were doing what the problem did. And the, the colors that they chose really make it look as if the Amazon is going to be in terrible shape because we'll be losing 0.8 millimeters of rain a day. Now actually, that would only drop the Amazon by about 15%. And you probably couldn't tell. Um, that bit just watching around. 
But what went on behind that was a bit more complicated. And what really happened was they were testing just three places. North Pacific, there's California. South Pacific, there's Peru. And there's Namibia. And if you only did it in that place, you get a little bit more rain in this part of Australia, where they really like to have it, and a little bit more in the Amazon. And if you did it here, you get a little bit more in the Amazon over here. It's only when you zoom it off here that you get this drop in the Amazon. Now, what they've done is they've found that you get different results doing it in different places. That was really the important thing. So it was really well the naughty of them to publish that. Um, and there's been a bit of unpleasantness going on about that. And what I want to do is, well, there's just some calculations showing. Other people have done, done this, uh, and this is a group from um, Max Planck Institute. And they're showing that although you did all over the world, you did spraying everywhere, not just in those three special places, that you do get a reduction in rainfall, but most of it is uh, the red bits are reductions and the blue bits are increases. Most of it's happening over the sea. Now, who gives it down? There's less rain over the sea. But actually, you go to that's December, January, February. If you go to uh, June, July, August, only you've got some useful increases, places where they really quite like it. Let's go back again to the other one. Some blue bits over these bits, sorry, blue bits over the bits of Australia. So really we've got a very, very complicated situation with spray having different effects in different places. And I very much want to get an everywhere to everywhere transfer function of what spray here does in this place elsewhere. And a way you might be able to do this is to break up the oceans into lots of different regions. Here's, here's Africa here, and here's the Indian Ocean, here's South America. It's a bit difficult to see, but here's all the different, there's actually 89 of them, of roughly equal elements. And then what I want to do is to randomly change the computer's instructions about what the cloud condensation and the PI are. And what I will do is to either multiply them by 1.5 or divide them by 1.5, and because of the logarithmic relationship that you saw earlier, that should have no net effect, but it's just really the differences. And if you uh, if you do this and you then correlate what happens to all the weather records in all over the world, you may be able to say what's happening if you spray it to everywhere else. And uh, what we did was to get uh, uh, the, the black thing here is a bit of north of the area, and you can see that if you spray here. Uh, you, you are getting blue moons less. Um, sorry, they haven't got the color code sort of that. Uh, blue in this one means means less, and you are indeed agreeing with the uh, that had the same prediction. But there's lots and lots of other places where it's red, and if you did it up here, you'd offset all the uh, what you did from up Namibia. And if we go to the next one here, we're looking another bit of the Amazon. And blow me down. If you spray up in the oceans, so there's a very, very strong wetting thing going on. So we really must need, must get this this worked out. So far, it's only been a small part of one PhD been done in the US of Leeds. I tried to get to have this entity on some air computers, and they said they didn't think it would work. And it turned out that the chief scientist of GET, Dr. David McKay, had worked on pseudo random sequences for this PhD, and he said that I'm going to do it. And they did it, and they found that it worked in some places, not everywhere. But they wouldn't tell me where they are. They're not releasing any information. So there's a whole lot of politics behind this. Now, let's see where they would work. If you look at that, that picture there, there's a whole lot of different gray scales running from black to white. If you hold up your hands like that and adjust them so that you can tell that there's been a difference between the left and the right. And if you do that, everybody does that, you'll see that you need to have three or four bars to be sure that you've got a gradient, all right? And that means that you can, there are 5% of gradients of bar, depending on this projection. But uh, that means you can detect about 20% change in the brightness of the cloud if you look at it. All right? And we're trying to get half a percent to save the Earth. So it's going to be really difficult to say we've done it. What I did here was to get uh, 
some uh, the shapes of different sprays at different angles. I put in a half life for the decay of the drops, sort of, sort of a couple of days or so, and I've got different angles of dispersion. So those are what weights of the spray might look like if there was no sidings. And that's going from a dead white to a dead white. And then what I did was I took the, 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 the nuclei concentration from this sort of diagram and applied the Fumi equation to a real cloud field. And you have to take a whole lot of uh, belief and say there's a white streak down here. All right? But if I take that uh, and I've got 100 of those images and add them up and divide them an average, I can see them coming up in this like that. And you can see certainly that, probably that as well. So this means that we can use satellite images to add together. But what you do is you take the satellite image, you center, you know where the, 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 your ship was placed. You center the image that you want it to place in, in the computer array. You rotate it to get the wind speed always in the same direction. And you just add them all up. And uh, that's comparing the two together. Maybe just it. This, by the way, is a real ship track here. That's, that's a genuine ship track, which for some reason or other we can see there. And I can't get that published. It, it's astonishing. Right. Now, I'll finish now. Uh, this, we, we had to call from Discovery Pictures, Discovery Channel, sorry, Discovery Channel, who wanted to do a story about all this. And but they desperately wanted to actually see uh, some clouds being blown. And we told them that we really had the hardware done, no spraying. Uh, so they thought they'd try and do it with cloud seeding flares. These are things that look like firework that send out a whole lot of little incandescent chloride uh, that's sort of about about to the size. And they were told that there was a beautiful place off South Africa, actually quite close to where the effect on South America would be biggest, uh, where they always had exactly the right kind of cloud And they put together a, a, a team to, to do this for these cloud scene There was more than 40 people and there was an airplane and three helicopters and two ships. And it was a big, big. Right? And when we all arrived, there wasn't a cloud in the sky, not a cloud in them. So they paid for all this, they all the all the water. And they don't actually want it's good TV to have a dismal failure. This is good as a success. So they said, you know, they're not the obvious, you know, our jaws dropping. We told them we thought we wouldn't have done the technical anyway, but they they were fabulous. And that is a fireman in fire department here spraying the deck to try and stop it melting. That's me filming him. And we let this thing off. And blow me on for about ten minutes, that came out of nothing. And that's about four and a half kilometers wide, four and a half kilometers this way, and it's probably reflecting about 800 uh, watts per square meter. And when you work it out, it's uh, about, for about now, that was reflecting as much solar energy as Scotland's electricity, is about five kilometers, about eight gigawatts altogether. Uh, we were completely staggered, it was, it was surprised. So, I think that's probably all I want to say. Let's see what I do. Oh, this is just to show you, by the way, quite interesting. There was more energy going in to the south pole than there is into the equator. The reason is that it's going in for 24 hours. Um, I've got that for body. Yeah, I think we'll leave that. So, questions? The boat trails are they, are they generated? Is that the from the smokestacks? Yeah, there's something in the particles in the smoke yeah. which uh, make quite extra nuclei. So the cloud just over where that's being is okay. uh, It happens about 16 kilometers behind the ship, so it comes up later on. And to see it means there's a hell of a big effect. It only happens if the air is being specially cleaned. The, the air mass there would have come up from the Antarctic 
And it might have been scrolling around the internet for months and months before it became up here. It works, especially if you do. I don't think I'd like to repeat that. Yeah. yeah. You know if there's any unintended side effects that can happen? If you're increasing the water vapor and the water vapor is Well, we're putting out the amount of salt we're putting out, which is 1%. If we had to do all the double CO2, we have to do it really flat out. The amount of salt we'd be putting out would be 1% of what goes up from all the breaking waves. Now, the difference is we're putting it up at exactly the sweet diameter to get the effect we want. And some people say that if we don't do that, if you have drops that are too small, they work the wrong way around. Uh, that might actually be useful if you go to those directions kind of stuff. That could be good. But at the moment, we're trying to go for a longer dispersing. And if we don't want it, we just turn it off. We would need to have about 300, it's actually 200 or something, but let's say 300 ships to offset damage done to date. And if you look around for something which has the same sort of cost, you may send your production on this, you can get, get, get cost. The nearest thing I found is the Royal Navy frigates, which we built against the German submarines in World War II. 1940, a frigate uh, so, so, a Corvette. A Corvette, a Corvette cost sixty thousand pounds, and that's about two million now. But the Corvette had a lot more power, and bigger to be tonnage. The Cruel Z, hmm? the Cruel Z, the Cruel Z. That's right. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't think much of the sixty thousand went for the comfort of the crew. By the way, that's mm. very rough for them. But uh, if you scale that up, it's reasonable to predict that we could make a spray vessel in that similar quantity. I mean, I think we made about two, two, three hundred of them. Uh, we could tank for about, for about two million quid. And so we need about uh, 600 million pounds. Uh, but the ships last for uh, about 20 years, 25 years. So if you work out the annual payments, it might be um, 60 million a year for paying the bank and paying you know, the, 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 the cost. Um, that's 10% interest. Uh, which means that th this system is cheaper by a factor of about two than uh, the annual conferences. It's really of the same sort of order as the really top professional um, football transfer fee. Um, uh, Ronaldo cost 80 million then. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's really in the noise. I, I have a lot of trouble trying to raise money for the next level of research. And I said, something awful will have to happen to the web before we're going to get any political interest. And something awful has. <laughs> I shouldn't be checking on you. <laughs> I'm not checking on you. Right. So you spoke in like, terms of we a few times. Have you got a sort of team working on this, or who's on um, well? Uh, John Nathan, who sort of out here, I'm in contact with several times a week, he has a very close friend of his called Alan Gavin. And there was one PhD student at Leeds who's now finished. So there's nobody being paid for this. I'm fairly full time on it. Um, <coughs> but um, there's, there's, there's a chap in America uh, who was an inkjet pioneer who's trying to make spray. And he did get a bit money. From um, somebody in the West Coast, America. and uh, I'm in correspondence with, with a um, funding body in California now. We haven't actually signed anything yet. So I'd like to get a group of about three or four engineers to um, argue with me. I can pass over everything that um, I've, I've got so far. I'm, I'm uh, knocking on the ground. So I want to make sure it doesn't die with me every night gets in. And it seems not quite that nice. Or less is. <laughs> more than double the population pool. No, double the population pool is more than double the intelligence. <laughs> yeah. Is the degree of certainty the area of the class of war specific? Sorry, I'm not hearing you very well. I've been too close to too many words. I was wondering what, if there's a degree of certainty or error limits on the zones that would get more or less precipitation. Like, could that 
shift up, like I was thinking it's a zone of less precipitation shifted up to Central America, mm -hmm. in effect is Panama. There goes the canal operation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they need the daily rain to use the law. Right. So, but I, I don't know, but we could maybe get a feeling from it. We wonder if we can just come right back to um, we'll see how big um, I'll go back. There, that's telling you roughly the size of the affected area. Does that help you? Yeah. Um, I mean, we don't have all that much control. The wind is blowing what is going all over the place. But I just thought that would be, would be the, the, the size of the target. Yeah. All right. I'll follow along when you get to the Right. Um, I'll tell you a bit about them. The last one they did was the first time they ever mentioned geoengineering. The next thing about them is that they're not allowed to use any information that has not been in the referee journal for two years. Okay. Now, if you know how long it takes to get a paper into the referee journal, it can easily be a year. But you know how long it takes to do the work that you put into the journal, that can take a bit longer too. So my image is that the IPCC is about like having news of an incoming photograph array ready by Normandy Brain. That, that's what they are. Now they are what what goes into them is really influenced very much by the home government. The drafts are sent to home government so that it is saying we need to change this. And they're really like ferrets in the sun. And they are now, in the last thing, they didn't have anything at all about the Arctic amplification, anything at all about the black hole. So I think they are <coughs> really quite useful, actually. Um, anybody here? And there is really venomous uh, attacks on all this from the people in, a lot of people in, in the Hadley I suppose on the background of this, uh, I thought that um, the Gemp is underway almost in the imagination to release something like that. It's not the one country that can really put the boundary. Yes. The, 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 the sort of thing, and we're trying to, we think it's just what we call the cool country. So lots of people in, Russia, who are investing in oil and gas, who want to be able to get the oil and gas in Africa, and they are going to flag this at very hard. To give you a feeling about that, we found out how much money has been spent on public relations by the deniers. It's $900 million has been spent up to now to discredit people who are worried about climate change. $900 million. Against that, we see that day, again, doing the moment. Can you imagine a, uh, the form of some sort of international treaty that would allow this to happen without essentially taking the pressure off all governments to produce CO2? It looks like working against the temperature, but you know, can, you, can you then buy our bigger 4 by 4s and get yeah. on with it? Well, we are, a lot of the people who are against this idea and other ideas for, um, uh, say, if you did get this going, then the pressures to produce CO2 are, would, would be taken off. But there, there, there's no success anyway. We're saying, do as much as you can uh, for renewable energy. And maybe I've done a bit you know, on that. Uh, <laughs> do as much as you can, we'll clear up what you can't do. The difficulty is that the carbon dioxide that we've released so far has not had anything like its full effect. It's going to be around for hundreds of years, but it still hasn't done all the wrong it's going to do. So even if you stop all carbon emissions today, it's still going to go on getting warmer. And the chances of you being able to do that are zero. I mean, you can, we can see that healing curve going out now. Um. How much scalable is this? 
Can you briefly imagine if you had it in a field of only one country? And imagine if you, you know, spray in the middle of the country and decide where a local cloud is. I think we, we have a job well. If, if this code of modulation and pseudo everything works, we might be able to do that, but I suspect it will be bigger than that. Now, we know this because we know that the El Nino Southern Oscillation in the Pacific, which is a sort of big part of temperature variation, has effects right up into Siberia. And we, what we could do is to say, if you don't want such a big El Nino, we can uh, cool the hot side, whichever side it is. Um, so we might be able to do, but it's a that for a course in uh, We could probably stop islands in Morgans and places like that from getting sea level rise, but everybody I think would like to have the sea, stop sea level rise. You can't be anyone who'd like to have more sea level. Um, so there would be a general UN approval of reducing sea level rise. But we could also have a go at El Nino. Maybe you want a little bit because it produces rainfall in South America. But you can have it to lower altitudes. Extreme El Nino is a really bad. And, um, you can speak a bit about the um, Sorry, I'm, my hearing is not very good. As you say, maybe I've understood a little, uh, have fully understand the slide about the discipline about the thermostat. This is looking at the solar radiance production. But when you have home slaving, heaters surrounding the outside of the room, and then the, mm -hmm. the vapor would rise, and then the yeah. pressure, the, the hot air would slide in. My understanding is that's how you, know, you get the, the doldrums to hurricane, looks like, mm -hmm. in, in a um, mid-latitude around the equator. And I wonder, you know, what kind of impact, if you look at it, this kind of scale? Well, uh, we, we wrote a paper about the effect on hurricanes. And if you choose to do it in the right sort of place, before the hurricane arrives, once hurricanes go, you can't end it But the hurricanes begin, the ones that get all publicity, the ones that hurt Americans. And those hurricanes begin over in the ivory coast. And they start off with a little circulation and get bigger and bigger and bigger. We can certainly reduce those. We don't want to eliminate them, but we can make a number four go down to number two. Uh, and we want to do this not from the hurricane being announced, but uh, you want to be looking at all the sea surface temperatures. And whenever it gets near to 26.5, you want to be cooling there. And uh, you, you want to be able not, I mean, hurricanes provide a lot of very useful fresh water in uh, Mexico and, and Venezuela and the southern states of America. So we, we want the other ones, not the ones. But we don't want to totally redistribute energy. So what we like is the energy to go back to where it was, say 1950. <laughs> okay, so you could say, let's choose a nice year and we'll try and go back to that. What we're really doing is adding steering and brakes to a supermarket trolley that's got cast the wheels and it's just going around and around here. And if we had the engine and hardware program to do this, and we could learn how to drive them and put the brakes on, which is reverse gear, then we'll so then by that to learn how to drive incredibly. But if you don't have the hardware, you can't run. Yeah. So about a year ago, we had a presentation from um, Dr. Mori from Kyoto University. One of the things he presented in that presentation was he was presenting some um, teleconnection diagrams from global circulation models showing exactly these mm -hmm. kind of effects of where did sea surface temperature changes in that case affect the uh, generation of uh, cyclones and, and um, mm. uh, the typhoons. typhoons. Um, and I wonder whether you looked at, the, at some of these teleconnection maps to see whether the, the kind of thing that's being provided here. No, what, what, what we did was just to run the kind of models. Yeah. We said, here's a kind of model that really is going to be developing. Let's see in this kind of crude box here. Yeah. Because the, the, the teleconnection maps are outputs yeah. from these global circulation. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure there would, there would be another, but there's more than this in the use of the model. Mm -hmm. But by the way, the best kind of model is say, watch out, they're not very really reliable. Oh, yeah. It's only yeah. the bad ones that come from there. Well, quick question. I found this thing right when you want to do this in areas where you've got boundary layer instability. You can get a little bad. So you're going to have. 
large cumulonimbus, I presume, which is going to be transporting lots of water into the apparatus here after that. Bit. And water vapor. So well, we're not adding yeah. very much to what's evaporating at the moment. And, and the most of the transfer upwards is actually at night. What happens is that the sea is almost constant temperature, and at night the air cools down quickly. So you've got hot down the bottom and cold up, and that's what makes the stuff go up again. Yeah. Um, so the amount that we're putting up is tiny compared with the natural evaporation. Remember, the natural evaporation also has natural condensation, and water can come in and out, and in and out very, very fast. We've got a cold sea that could be a mist. Um, so we're really not affecting the total water mass. What we're doing is affecting the nuclei. Okay. Um, yeah, the surface that's true, but once it's transported to the upper atmosphere, is that not a problem? I don't know we get very much to the upper atmosphere. I, I think it, it, the, the, the rate at which the nuclei fall is very, very slow. It's mainly distributed by turbulence. Only if you've got, uh, well, you can sometimes get a really powerful jet going up. If going up cools it, uh, makes it condense, it's humid air, and then there's, there's heat coming out of that, which makes it go faster and faster and faster. Yeah. It's almost like a rocket then. And then we, we, we can get stuff going right up high. I don't know, we would perhaps try and avoid spraying underneath one of those. We, didn't want the, we don't really want the nuclei up high because the cirrus stuff, um, works in the other direction. It's tropospheric stuff that we want. But you know, we can we can turn them off just with one email. Because of it. I think we'll we'll stop there. Quite a lot of questions. If you guys join me, one last time. So warming the sea up on the bridge is not going to